Okay, hello folks, welcome to uh, webinar Wednesday. Let me just update the screen there. Uh, so here we go. Welcome. Welcome to June's um, webinar. Uh, joined, as always, by myself, Summer Mesa uh, and Liz Mayhew. Good afternoon, everyone. And through the course of this afternoon's um, webinar, we're going to talk to you about developing and reviewing job descriptions and give you some advice and guidance on that topic. As ever, we've got you here for about an hour um, or thereabouts. We've got a series of um, slides to talk you through, some useful uh, hints, tips and tricks. Uh, opportunity for some questions as we go through. Um, we've got a couple of quizzes in there because, well, it's Wednesday afternoon and why not? Um, in terms of communicating with us this afternoon, those of you who are regular uh, visitors to our webinar Wednesdays, you'll know about the friendly uh, webinar toolbar that you can see on screen there. If you look down towards the bottom, you can see a chat box. Uh, click to open that and you can type in sort of questions and comments there. In terms of allowing time for questions, we always look to do that if um, we find ourselves running a little bit low um, on time or there is a, uh, a good number of questions that come through. Um, we'll make a note of the questions that are, uh, are in that chat feature there and we'll look to um, respond to people uh, outside of the, the webinar. We'll come back to you via email. So do feel free to uh, make a note of your questions. OK, let's get started properly, though. And and let's have a look at what we're going to be covering this afternoon, Liz. OK, well, as always, packed agenda. Um, you can see up there on the screen. I'm going to start this afternoon by looking at why do we need and why do we have written job descriptions? What's their purpose and why are they important? We're then going to move on and look at the two key elements, um, the job description itself, and then alongside that, the person specification. Um, have a look at what uh, each part of those documents should contain in terms of content. We're going to have a, a few moments looking at um, accountabilities versus tasks. And this is something that um, often when you're writing job descriptions can be quite challenging to identify not every single task a person undertakes in their role, but what they are accountable for. And we're going to talk you through how you might develop a list of tasks into a series of accountabilities that perform the backbone of your job description. I want to touch on language considerations and how you actually describe what an individual is doing. And that can be quite important and can help us inform the grade for the post um, when we think about uh, the, the verbs you're using to describe what the person is actually undertaking. undertaking rather. Then going to move on and look at uh, the process of reviewing job descriptions and person specifications, uh, look at the benchmarking process, and then finish with a series of top tips for you to take away when you're next writing the job description in your own school. So that's what we're covering. And as ever, um, a really packed agenda. So let's um, make a, a prompt start. So with no further ado, um, why have a written job description anyway, Liz? <laughs> I guess there's a number of reasons why. We need a written job description. It sets out the essence of the role, so it defines the role and the expectations attached to that in terms of you as an employer, as a manager, in setting out the expectations of the accountabilities and the responsibilities that a particular role should have within your school. It summarises the job purpose and the impact. So in having this post in the school, what, what is the effect? What are they bringing to the operation of the school? And we'll look at that um, in a bit more detail as we go through this afternoon. The job description is the key document for setting out the responsibilities and accountabilities of the individual. So as I said previously, not all the tasks a person does, but those key elements that they are ultimately responsible or accountable for. And because it's those key responsibilities, the job description is really important and that should absolutely sits alongside sort of the contract in terms of the backbone of that employment relationship, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And certainly when, when there are performance issues in a role, you'd want to have a really well-defined uh, job description to be able to refer to, to demonstrate where it is the post holders fall short of your expectations for yeah. them in the role. So absolutely a key documentation. JD should also set out the reporting and line management arrangements, so there's absolute clarity in those reporting um, uh, hierarchies, so who does the role report to, and in turn, who does that role uh, manage, so it gives clarity around that. 
um, for our purposes, in supporting you in assessing the appropriate grade um, for, a, for a job in a school. Um, it's the key piece of evidence that we need to help with what's called benchmarking, and that is the process of assessing and evaluating what Kent Range grade a post should be paid against. And for us to have a good, clear, concise job description is like gold dust in helping us assess the appropriate grade for a role. Obviously, it's a key tool for your recruitment and selection process. It is the document you will make available to prospective candidates to make them aware of what the role entails. And it's also the document against which you will assess potential candidates during the recruitment process, whether that be for shortlisting or for interviewing. You'll be looking at the accountabilities of the role and, crucially, the um, person specification criteria in assessing whether a candidate truly meets the requirements for the post. So I guess in summary, it's an essential document for recruitment, but also important for the ongoing monitoring and review of performance. And it's useful at regular intervals throughout someone's employment to revisit the yeah. document and make sure it truly reflects what an individual is doing in their role. Absolutely. That's why the focus of, of today's session is very much the development and review um, of job descriptions, because it's really important that those that they're kept um, uh, under review and that they remain fit for purpose. Yeah, and that's a living, breathing document. Yeah. Because work and workplaces don't stand still, accountability is evolving, and you want to make sure that your written documentation reflects that. Absolutely. And also, as Liz mentioned, supports you um, with those uh, sort of ongoing HR management issues. So if there are concerns around performance or even actually rewinding from that, and it's a key document um, to review uh, as part of the appraisal cycle, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sort of looking at someone's performance over the year, assessing that against the expectations of the role, looking at areas for development for the future year. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so that's why we want um, to give you uh, top tips around um, writing, uh, developing rather, and reviewing job descriptions because it is such a key document. So let's take a moment now to look at the key components of this all important job description. Okay, yeah, so I guess there's four key elements that you'd expect to find in a job description, and you can see that is summarised on the slide. So the head of the job description, you'd expect to say uh, have an indication of the management accountabilities. So who does this role report to? And in turn, who does this role line manage? And you might express that in terms of uh, the, the job title that they report to, and in turn, those job titles and roles that they, they manage. Um, and the reason for that is to have absolute clarity in those reporting hierarchies. Uh, beyond that, in the job description, you'd expect to see a concise summary setting out the purpose of the post. So really a core statement of the core key elements of the role and its impact. Um, that really kind of bottoms out what the role is intended to achieve and what contribution the post has to make to your school. Often it's quite hard to come up with a, a concise statement along those lines. I've got an example there on the slide for you. So for a receptionist, a kind of a purpose statement might be something along the lines of to provide an efficient reception service to support the smooth operation of the school. So really a one line, quick, easy summary of what that post will bring and achieve in the, in the school. Yeah. Okay. Beyond that, um, you move into, the, I guess, the meat of the job description, um, an outline of those key responsibilities and accountabilities attached to the role. So it's not a list of tasks, and you wouldn't expect to see every single job that the person, the person undertakes set out in the document, but it's a summary of those areas that the individual is accountable for. Ideally, if possible, you'd be looking at developing eight to ten key responsibilities or accountability statements. Maybe that you have a few more of those depending on the role of the yeah. responsibilities. But what you would be wanting to see would be pages and pages of accountabilities. So if you start with the idea, the idea is eight to ten, um, that's from a good starting place. And the fourth element of the uh, job description uh, really is a statement um, picking out any particular um, features of the context in which the person is working in. So you can see there some examples. If the post holder is expected to work across multi sites, for example, or to take shift work, or if there's anything particularly physically demanding about the role, 
you'd expect to see that captured in a content statement, just so any potential applicants were fully aware of, of the nature of the role in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think particularly uh, if it is related to sort of shift work and, and uh, uh, sort of working environment and, and that sort of structure and yeah. context. Yeah, yeah, it's crucial um, that the person that fully understands the context in which they're going to be working in. So that's the fourth element that we'd suggest um, ensuring you capture in that job description. Okay, um, I've just uh, picked up on a couple of issues that people um, have mentioned uh, with sound quality. So just bear with us uh, for a moment while we try to uh, ensure that we resolve those for you um, and we'll keep going. So um, let's... Um, we're going to come back to job descriptions um, in a moment because we're going to look at... Um, uh, determining those key accountabilities, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, but let's just take a, a very quick sidestep to another um, really important document that sits alongside the job description, the sort of sister uh, to the job description or sibling, if I'm uh, <laughs> if I've got my equalities hat on. <laughs> Um, and have a look at the person spec and I'm also just going to double double check on those audio issues for you so let's have a think about person spec components. Yeah so it's kind of the counterpart to the job description um, and this element the person specification sets out the criteria you expect the successful post holder to demonstrate and I guess there's really five aspects of this again summarized on the slide. Firstly, on the person spec, you'd want to be capturing the qualifications that you require in your post holder. And this should be a statement of the minimum qualifications that are required and picking out those qualifications that are essential for the role as opposed to those which may be desirable. And I think there's a temptation often when writing a job description to try and encompass every single possible qualification that you think the post holder may need. In actual fact, sometimes it's useful just to take a step back and think about what qualifications are truly essential and perhaps take care not to overinflate the qualification requirements. So it's just about thinking um, clearly about what the key qualification requirements are. You'd want within this to be clear about any specifics in terms of the qualification and also the precise uh, level the qualification. So if it was a graduate level qualification, postgraduate for example, or if it was a qualification requiring a lower level, maybe a level two, level three, GCSE, A level equivalent standard, you'd want to be setting out uh, the level of that qualification requirement. So you'd always expect to see indication of qualifications on the person's specification and alongside that you'd probably expect to see a statement of the experience that's required of the individual. And with the experience it's important to be as specific and as realistic as possible in what you require. Again, it might be helpful to identify experience in terms of the uh, essential elements of experience and those that are desirable. And again, have a good think about what is realistic for a role of that kind in terms of the prior experience. We'd always say take care um, when you're thinking about experience not to express that in terms of the number of years. Mm. Um, the reason for that is that it could potentially be age discriminatory. Um, if you were specifying 15 years experience mm. required, that potentially to younger candidates, um, you know, we might put a bar against them applying, when actually it's not necessarily about the uh, duration of the experience, but the quality. Yeah. So sometimes it's helpful to um, uh, express that experience in terms of proven higher level experience of X or proven high, uh, middle management experience of Y rather than a set number of years. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so the third aspect you'd expect to see on the person specification um, is a summary of the skills and abilities required of the post holder. Again, you'd want to be thinking of the uh, area and level of the skill and ability that the person would need to demonstrate. And you might want to have a think about capturing not just the hard skills, for example, um, uh, good ICT skills, for example, that would be a hard skill, but also the soft skills. So maybe those interpersonal skills, 
teamwork in communication skills, problem solving that you would expect to see um, in the successful candidate. And the person specification should really be in this area of balance between those hard and those soft skills. I think sometimes the soft skills are, are overlooked. Yeah. But when you're assessing for fit within the organisation, to have a sense of whether the individual um, can work as a team, yeah. can work proactively, um, it's important to be able to kind of assess that and capture that in your, in your person's Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Not just thinking about technical competence, but actually um, what the individual brings uh, in and of themselves in terms of their ability to work with others, their yeah. leadership capabilities, if we were looking at uh, uh, team leader, supervisory yeah. or, or management um, role. So not always just thinking about technical competence, because actually a good number of candidates will have that technical competence. It's about what else, what are those other attributes that you're looking for to be able to make best use of that technical competence in your school, in your setting, given the rigours of, of your world of, of work yes. and with the team or teams that they need to work with. Yeah, the kind of golden nuggets over and above the essential skill set. Yeah. Um, yeah, though those softer skills that will really add to what yeah. the individual can bring to the role. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the point about uh, when we think about experience and sort of quantity or tenure um, is not an indicator of quality. Um, and so, yes, I could have been in a particular role for five years, um, which might meet the sort of requisite criteria, but that's no indicator indicator of the quality of work um, that I've achieved over that time frame, the, my ability to work with others, whether that's immediate colleagues or whether that's your sort of children, young people or wider stakeholders as part of your um, school community. So yeah, the opportunity to think beyond um, sort of tenure and, and uh, I say beyond technical competence, but uh, uh, yeah, the quality yes. behind. Yeah, the notwithstanding quality. technical competence, mm. but but looking uh, further forward than yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so um, in addition to skills and ability, you'd probably want to capture a statement um, on person spec uh, uh, summarising the knowledge the post holder would bring to the role. Again, specifying the area and level of that uh, knowledge. And sometimes in a school setting, there's really um, specific knowledge that you might require through having worked previously in a school setting that is absolutely a prerequisite for a role. In other um, uh, cases, it might be that knowledge gained in other work settings um, is equally relevant and appropriate to the role. So have a think about the knowledge, the level of that knowledge, and where you might expect that post holder to have acquired that knowledge. Is it through a previous school role, a previous uh, public sector role, a previous role working with children? So yeah, have a think about the context in which that knowledge is, is um, has been gained. Yeah. And then the final element, and this is perhaps an optional element um, in terms of person spec, is behaviours. And I guess you can summarise this in terms of it's not what you do, but how you do it. So you might want to have uh, a section on your person spec where you're demonstrating or you're, where you're setting out those behaviours. So things like working collaboratively, working innovatively, working proactively, um, uh, all attributes that describe how a post holder might work. You might capture that in a behaviours statement. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that more and more, um, building up from what you were saying, Summer. It's not just about those technical competencies, but it's the way the way person yeah. delivers those in the role. Absolutely. And if we link to to the sort of well-being agenda and thinking about sort of another key um, area of focus in terms of well-being and resilience um, it's not, again not just about having those technical competencies but can I be an effective classroom teacher can I be um, effective in my um, office administrative role and be resilient in the rigors of working within education so I think the opportunity to explore that um, area and look to start helping individuals to both self-assess as part of the recruitment process but also give you the opportunity to assess for those attributes and those behaviours and mindsets mm -hmm. alongside that technical competence I think is going to stand everybody in really good stead. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just to add, when thinking about all the elements of the person specification, um, a word of warning I guess, thinking about criteria that can be objectively assessed. 
So you want to be using when you're recruiting this person specification as your kind of checklist through the recruitment process to assess whether someone meets those criteria. And you need to be able to objectively assess whether someone uh, does in fact meet those. So statements that maybe refer to someone having a good sense of humour. We quite often see that on a, on a person's spec. But have a think about how you would objectively assess that as part of a recruitment process. And it might be you want to think about rewording those kind of statements, maybe not express it in terms of a, a good sense of humour, but maybe something along the lines of a strong team working ethos, something like, like that, yeah. which you might be able to more objectively assess um, than um, having to make a judgment about how funny something <laughs> is. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so yes, job descriptions, person spec, um, really important. Certainly the person spec um, is sort of the backbone of the recruitment process in terms of your um, uh, shortlisting will come from the person spec, your selection and um, activities should enable you to be able to assess against these criteria and of course your interview questions will be again looking to assess that an individual has, has uh, met these criteria uh, and so really important document and well worth us spending a, a moment on that. But let's go back to job descriptions then um, and let's have a look at constructing accountabilities. Yes, I think in all honesty this is probably the most challenging part of putting together a job description. Um, working from a list of tasks and developing those into a series of accountabilities. Uh, I guess uh, the best way to probably approach this is think of a funnel. Um, and you can see a kind of uh, an inverted triangle there on your screen. Um, and it's a process whereby initially you might just brainstorm all the individual tasks that a person will be responsible for. And you might have many, many, many of these across many different areas. Get those down on paper, do a bit of a brain dump, put all of those down, all the individual tasks. Once you've got that, the next step is to refine those a little more and group them in to get together into related um, areas, related activities. So if you're thinking about an admin role, an individual might be answering the phone, doing photocopying, printing, doing word processing, data inputting. All those elements of the task could be grouped together under um, uh, one, one kind of area. So go through the bigger task list and, and try where possible to group those into maybe eight to ten main areas. It is a challenge, um, but, but um, well worth spending that time just refining the tasks into uh, separate groups. And the third stage of constructing an accountability is to work those tasks into a series of broad statements to clearly summarise the accountabilities um, that the person has within those group of tasks. So it's a three-stage process. Identify the tasks, draw them together into 10 main areas, and then try and uh, further refine those down into those ultimate accountabilities which will appear on the job description. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's have a look then at accountabilities versus tasks. And here is the first of our sort of quizzes uh, for this afternoon. Um, so just bear with me a moment while I look to set that up for you. Um, okay, so on screen, you can hopefully see um, a question that asks you um, to look at a series of statements and asks you to identify um, those statements that, that clearly um, reference accountabilities as opposed to uh, simply a task to be performed be performed. Um, so click all that apply um, and see if you can get the right answer and then we'll come together and have a look at uh, what that looks like. I'll give you a few moments for that. Okay, a couple of folks straight off the bat uh, putting some answers together there. Okay, a few more of you have completed it. Okay. 
Okay. Last minute or so, folks. Silence. <laughs> Should we put people out of their misery? Shall we? Okay, if you are just on the verge of sort of clicking submit, um, then look to do that now because we're going to need to bring things back together and show you some answers. So, okay. Do, do, diddle, do, do. Okay, my best countdown impression there. This, by the way, is why it's probably not helpful to have a criteria has a good sense of humour because I find things like that funny <laughs> and possibly endearing. Others of you may definitely not. So if that's a good illustration, <laughs> we'll go with that. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to close uh, the test now, and we'll look to come together and uh, have a look at the answers. And uh, yes, my poor colleagues, bless them. Um, okay. So let's close that now, um, and hopefully we can see um, the results on screen. Just bear with me. Okay, hang on a second. There's some technical gremlins some in it today. Some technical gremlins, which is fine. We can manage that. That is okay. Review. Okay, we're going to review the results. And we're going to share the results with you folks. There we go. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of different screens that I have access to. So average score was 75. So well done you. I think we might be looking at an A or B grade for that. Grade for this, um, so. Or what's new money nowadays? Maybe oh, we won't go into. Yes. Maybe we won't go into that. That's probably a whole other webinar. Um, but yes, well done you folks. So um, a good number of you identified the correct um, answers, and you can see those in green there on screen. And actually, the next slide um, that we bring up for those of you who'd like to um, get a copy um, of our presentations which we'll send to you separately um, you'll have access to that um, uh, as well so let's get back to um, the screen and we'll keep things um, moving ahead okay Right. OK, I seem to have lost the screen for a moment, <laughs> which is always good fun. Uh, let's see if we can get back to the presentation. Uh -huh. Haha, you can now see it. Found Lovely. It. So, um, yes, for those of you who will uh, get a copy of uh, or make use of a copy of the presentation, we've highlighted the right answers there on the screen for you. So there you go. And uh, hopefully there you can see the distinction between the tasks, so the list of multiple elements, um, and the accountabilities, which are the broad statements summarising those multiple elements. Yeah. So hopefully that's illustrated the difference between the two. Okay, lovely. And thank you for bear with it, bear, bearing with um, the uh, little delay we had there in proceedings. So let's just unpick a little bit more those constructing accountabilities, and we've got a really useful um, sort of piece of advice for you around how you go about doing that, haven't we, Liz? Yeah, there is a particular framework that we'd really encourage you to have a think about when you're constructing the accountabilities and it's a three element uh, th three parts to the to the format for this accountability um, the first part is what is done the second part to or with what or whom and then the third part is why or with what impact 
And ideally, if you can try and frame all your accountabilities using that format, you'll have a really concise, clear summary of what the person's doing, with what impact and at what level. So there's a couple of examples um, on screen there for you. So when you're thinking about a teaching assistant, an accountability for a teaching assistant might be to, to prepare, and that's the what you've done, what, sorry, what is done, um, to prepare learning resources for pupils, that's the to what, and the third element, um, to support the effective delivery of lessons, and that's the impact or the result. Mm. So there's a kind of three-part accountability. If you're thinking about the data uh, manager role, there's another example there on the screen. So in this case, the what is to design and produce. Um, database reports is to the to what statement. And in order to provide an accurate and timely um, management in information, that's the impact or the result. Mm -hmm. So again, breaking down that accountability into three clear elements, what yeah. is done to what, and why or with what impact. Yeah. In all honesty, um, initially it can be a little challenging to um, work accountabilities in that way, but if you bear with it and have a think about that format, it really does produce um, good quality job descriptions yeah. that are really um, honing in on, on the level that the person is uh, working at and their precise responsibility. Yeah. I think it also gives a sense of, of sort of focus and purpose as well, particularly thinking about to achieve what result or the impact. It really focuses people. Um, so beyond a, a list of tasks, what are they there to achieve? What's the impact that I need to have in my role? Yeah, and certainly from our point of view, when we're supporting you in um, assessing the grade of a role, um, that impact statement becomes all the more important as you move through to the more senior grades, because at a more senior grade, you would expect that impact to be greater or wider or longer term. Mm -hmm. So for us to have an accountability written in this format is like gold dust in terms of uh, benchmarking. I appreciate it, it is a timely exercise to do this and it may not always be possible to construct your accountabilities in that way and that's completely fine but we wanted to share that with you um, as from experience. Um, it's a very useful sort of framework for you yeah, to try and work to. Absolutely. Um, and thinking then about the uh, value of, of language, the importance of language, particularly thinking in terms of more senior roles and, and needing to have that impact sort of beyond your immediate uh, role or work area. Um, let's unpick language a little bit more, um, particularly in relation to grades. And we've got this bit of advice for you. Yeah, so the use of language is really important. And the verbs that you choose to describe what someone's doing is absolutely critical and can tell you an awful lot about the level that they're working at. So the verb is kind of the what is, what is done element, so the opening statement of your accountability. And on the screen there, you can see some examples of the kind of language you might expect um, describing activities at the lower end of the grading scale, KR2, KR4, up to the more senior end, KR9, KR11. So if we take a moment to look at the language at the lower level end, um, you've got words like assisting, actioning, recording, inputting, and these are all quite limited and narrow and discrete actions. Um, very much task-based, um, a focus on a single activity um, with kind of narrow impact. And then if you look at the other end of the spectrum, up towards KR9, KR11, you've got statements along the lines of to lead, to review, to develop, to advise, to interpret. And I hope you can see how those are perhaps broader, wider statements with uh, maybe involving longer term actions and also a wider, uh, more significant impact. It's not an exhaustive list there, but hopefully that gives you an indication of the kind of language you might be expecting um, to use when you're looking at roles um, of different grades. Yeah. Um, just a word of caution about two words that we often <laughs> see on job descriptions, uh, administer and manage. Um, I know they're generic terms that we use day to day, but from the purpose of uh, developing a job description, they're not always that helpful because managing can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
and often we see the the word managers when perhaps someone's not necessarily managing maybe they're coordinating or preparing or organizing they may not be managing and likewise the word administer again it's a word we use day in day out but it can again mean different things to different people. Um, so again, we would probably suggest just unpicking that a little bit more and really delving into exactly what are they doing? Are they collating, processing, actioning, recording, and just kind of unpick those umbrella statements into something that perhaps um, a little more clearly, clearly describes what the post holder is yeah. actually doing. Absolutely. I hope folks um, agree that that's really, really useful um, advice and, and a sort of helpful, um, I say ready reckoner, but a, a helpful point of reference um, when thinking about developing um, job descriptions. So. And again, from our point of view, if we're helping you assess the grade of a role, we'll be looking out for the use of the language and, and, and the uh, descriptors that you're using. And we'll want to see for a role that's graded KR2 to KR4, that language down that lower end is being used and we wouldn't suddenly have maybe a, a midday meal supervisor mm -hmm. whose responsibilities are described in terms of leading and managing, because that would suggest a role of a very different uh, nature. So we're looking to see that those um, descriptors are sort of consistent for where we expect the role to be graded ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Liz. Really, really useful. Um, another key point, um, so having talked about um, language, another key point that of course all of us need to have on our um, radar um, and uh, thinking about job descriptions is uh, safer recruitment. So let's just spend a, a moment thinking about this. Yeah, so you'll be aware from your safer recruitment training that safer recruitment messages should be an absolute consistent thread all the way through your recruitment process. And this includes capturing those within uh, the job description. Mm -hmm. So an applicant should be absolutely crystal clear of the, about their responsibilities in terms of um, promoting and safeguarding the welfare of children. Um, there's a generic statement that you might choose to use, but by all means, do develop, develop your own and something that's more meaningful for your own particular school and context. But the generic statement up there on the screen um, talks about being responsible for promoting and safeguarding the welfare of children and young people within the school. And at the very minimum, we'd want to see a statement along those lines. Yeah. Of course, if a post holder has additional specific responsibilities for safeguarding, so if they are a, um, a designated safeguarding mm -hmm. officer, you would want to see that safer recruitment accountability fleshed out. But this is a good generic statement that yeah. would appear on, on all job descriptions yeah, absolutely. in your school. Because everybody within a school, whether they work within the gates or potentially outside of the gates, if we're thinking sort of road crossing patrol, everybody attached to a school has a responsibility for um, promoting um, and safeguarding the welfare of children and people. And just on another note, because I am um, one of our safer recruitment um, trainers, so this is a particularly, um, well, it is an important topic, but it's also one that um, I am particularly passionate about. Um, I think that's also important to say um, in terms of we're talking about substantive members of staff in terms of job descriptions, but I think also with my safer recruitment hat on, thinking about ensuring that our um, small R recruitment of volunteers mm -hmm. um, is also robust and where uh, we might be talking about, we are talking about job descriptions for substantive staff, that could give way to a role profile um, for a volunteer and similarly I would be advising you to have um, a statement that talks about volunteers responsibility for promoting and safeguarding the welfare of children and making sure that that is absolutely explicit um, within the job description and within the, the uh, role profile and that absolutely it, it goes to support all the other work that you'll be doing no doubt um, with your safeguarding um, hats on so just a, a bit of a note um, there yeah. it is a topic that I'm particularly passionate about, as I'm sure we we all are. Um, okay, so just moving on from safer recruitment, then um, let's look then at assessing an appropriate grade. Yeah, so you've developed your job description, you've developed your person specification, and now you're thinking, oh goodness, what do I pay this person? Um, so thinking specifically about support staff roles, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a uh, library 
um, on the SPS website of more than 70 of the most common school roles, um, different types of roles and at different levels. And that's available if you're a customer of ours, that's available for you to access. So when you've developed your job description or if you're looking at developing mm. one, the library is a really good place to start because you might find that there's an example there that you can just draw off the shelf um, and it's something that you can use immediately when appointing a teaching assistant administrator, for example. Or you might want to use that as a starting point um, to further refine uh, and develop um, something that's specific to your school. Um, if you are developing something yourself in-house in terms of job description, you can also refer to this library um, and, and match what you've developed in your own school to examples within the library to identify what might be the appropriate grade. And when matching, it doesn't mean that the job has to be 100% the same, but the role just needs to be broadly um, similar in terms of level and nature of accountability. Yeah. Um, so that library is a really good tool to enable you to assess for yourselves um, the appropriate grade. Yeah. Absolutely, and not just thinking about matching to a job title, yes. um, but it. But within the um, library, there will be several different um, job descriptions for different levels of role. Albeit um, the job title is teaching assistant, but there will be a KR three job description within that. There will be a KR four. There's also examples of those higher level yeah. um, assistants as well. So you really have the opportunity to reflect on the the uh, sort of different uh, permutations of, of yeah. those roles and, and look to compare and contrast and, and match. Yeah, um, and like you say, Summer, we have got a, a range of teaching assistant examples. We've also got a range of finance admin and business manager examples that kind of really step you through grade by grade the accountabilities that you would expect to see attached to roles at different levels. So it's a really valuable resource. Yeah. And I would guess probably about 80% of roles you'll find a match or a close enough match with it within the library. Yeah. Um, the 70 job descriptions do cover a wide range. Yeah. And as Liz says, if not a direct match, then a great start to pretend to help you think about um, developing a more bespoke, yeah. uh, individualised job description for the particular role that you're you're looking at. Um, and in terms of um, sort of benchmarking. Yeah, so it may be that you're developing a perhaps a more unusual role within your school, um, something that's not a common school role or a variation on maybe one of those benchmark job descriptions in the library. Um, if, if that's the case, we offer a benchmarking service. That, so that's myself and a number of other colleagues who will look at your job description that you might develop in school and uh, do a desktop matching exercise where we match the accountabilities in your JD and person spec to agreed role profiles um, that are established in Kent for each of the Kent range grades from KR2 to KR15. Apologies, there's a typo. I'm Make reference to KR12 there, but KR2 to KR15. Um, so we would then review your job description and see what the best fit is against these agreed ro role profiles and then be able to give you a recommendation as to the grade. Those profiles aren't specific to individual jobs, but again, capture the levels of accountability. So we can apply those profiles to a wide range of different roles, um, education support roles, administrative roles, finance roles, um, really whatever role you might uh, develop in your school we can then look at that and match it against these generic profiles. So that's a service that we offer um, within your package if you're a consultancy customer, um, if you buy a consultancy service, and if not, it's a consultancy service that we charge at an additional uh, rate. And we'd always be more than happy to work with you. Um, on benchmarking and assessing the appropriate grade. Yeah, so as ever, you know where we are if you need us. So let's keep things moving ahead because I note that we're coming up to quarter two. Um, so when to review job descriptions and grades then? We've talked about them being a live document. We've talked about ensuring that they're sort of 
uh, robust and, and fit for purpose and continue to be fit for purpose um, over time. We've mentioned about discussing them um, at the sort of annual appraisal or as part of the annual appraisal cycle. But there may also be the need to review um, grades in other circumstances. Now, again, just bear with me. Um, I had set up another little um, quiz um, for this, but actually given some of the technical issues we've had this afternoon, I don't know that I'm feeling brave enough to make use of the technology, um, but um, ever the professional, um, there's a fail-safe slide that's about to come up in a moment. So let me just click through. So we're going to talk about when to review job descriptions and grades, and let just, let's just straight off pull up the examples and we'll talk through those instances. So here we go. So um, the two examples there of when you would be looking to review job descriptions and grades is certainly if there was a restructure or reorganisation of work. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're going through a change exercise in your school and the nature of a role has changed, the level of responsibility has changed through restructural reorganisation, that might be an opportune moment to revisit the job description to make sure it reflects what the person's going to be doing going forward and also alongside that to review whether the grade is still appropriate. Yeah. So absolutely that would be a time where you would be looking at reviewing both the JD and the grade. The other occasion when you would be looking at reviewing um, the JD and then potentially the grade is where the post holder has taken on additional higher level accountabilities. So it's not about taking on more accountabilities at the same level, which won't add to the overall accountability level of the role. It's about more um, accountabilities at a different level mm -hmm. that potentially will have a wider, greater impact or involve the post holder having um, a greater level of responsibility, then it would be an opportune time to review the job description and to revisit the grade to make sure it's more, more, uh, make sure it's appropriate yeah. um, to what the person's doing. And if we just pick up on that uh, first example there, and of course we would have uh, run this as a, as a quiz, but for fear of the uh, uh, technology this afternoon, the post holder has taken on more duties at the same level. Well, this bodes, um, bodes back to the importance of um, capturing key responsibilities and accountabilities as opposed to a list of tasks, because tasks and activities will naturally shift and change um, over time just through the nature of the job role, perhaps changing technologies, um, and, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the role is, is substantively different. Yeah, or that the level yeah. they're working at is any different. So it's not about adding more tasks, it's about the level of those tasks yeah. that would prompt a revisit of yeah. the grade. Absolutely. Yeah. We often get asked um, whether it's appropriate to review a job description and a grade um, because the post holders reach the top of their grade or where they've been performing um, at an excellent level in the post, or if the post holder um, uh, requests a regrade. In those circumstances, we'd really be looking for clear evidence that the accountabilities of the role had changed. So it's not about the person uh, performing well. It's not about them um, reaching the ceiling of the grade. It's about has something changed within the substance of the role yeah. and the accountabilities, which would lead us to revisit yeah. uh, uh, the level that they're paid at. Obviously, we're always happy to have a conversation with schools about the context in which you're requ uh, requesting that review. But as a rule of thumb, it, if it's about someone's performance, that should be rewarded through performance management yeah. um, and the TCP rating of their support staff, uh, not necessarily through a, a regrade. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so some additional advice there for you. OK, so let's um, start to, to bring uh, this afternoon to a close and let's just highlight some top tips. Um, so keep it simple. Um, remembering that it's not a list of tasks, but accountabilities, ideally 10. And do make sure to have the sort of key um, fundamental responsibility of um, promoting uh, the welfare um, of your children and young people and thinking about that safeguarding responsibility. Look to have that there um, as part of that. 
keep person specs relevant to the requirements of the role and we've obviously spent a bit of time looking at that this afternoon choose your language carefully both as a means of not wishing to uh, inadvertently um, or indirectly um, discriminate against um, candidates but also thinking about um, Liz's helpful uh, matrix there thinking about the language you use to describe um, the responsibilities um, so the importance of language uh, beware again those words that manage and administer one person's manager is another person's supervisor is another person's team leader those words are used so readily so interchangeably um, that as Liz mentioned for the purposes of, of a job description a detailed robust job description there are other words phrases verbs um, that are going to serve you far better uh, and provide um, helpful clarity to both you uh, your candidates if we're thinking about recruiting and your substantive job holders uh, if we're thinking about ongoing management regularly review job descriptions as the job evolves and we've talked about the link with um, the appraisal cycle and consider reassessing the grade if accountabilities change significantly um, and we're always on hand to provide some advice around um, those points um, just looking at the clock um, I make it about 10 to so we're fast coming up to the hour there is the opportunity very quickly to deal with some initial questions although um, as I I say please feel free to type your questions in and if we can't deal with all of those within the hour then we'll absolutely come back to folks um, through email so I'll give you just some time um, to jot any thoughts down whilst you're doing that um, let me just move on to our next slide which just highlights some sources of further information and resources for you so as Liz um, mentioned our SPS library of benchmark job descriptions I think 70 was the number quoted 70 odd job descriptions on there um, so a really valuable resource um, for you and you will find that um, online on our website in the resources area which is sort of top right hand um, of the screen um, similarly you can find a template job description and person spec um, sort of framework um, and also their reference to the teacher standards in fact that's important to say Liz isn't it in terms of the um, library of job descriptions what we don't have in there is a job description for teachers yeah, so the focus of this afternoon has been looking at support staff roles developing those job descriptions and also assessing the appropriate grade the principles we've talked you through around developing the person spec job description would be exactly the same for, as for a, for a a member of teaching staff um, as a member of support staff the only difference as you say is we don't actually have um, a library of teaching job descriptions in the same way because in fact the DfE um, nationally haven't established such a thing they very much leave it for schools themselves to determine what the content of a teaching role should look like and then the grade it should be paid at so we don't have any benchmarked examples that we can readily go to that said the teaching standards are a really good starting point if you're looking at teaching uh, job descriptions it's a really good starting point in developing your accountabilities because those standards absolutely summarize what a teacher should be delivering and the impact the role should be having so if you're thinking about teaching job descriptions have a look at those standards yeah absolutely and if you're thinking about um, I suppose the step on from that in terms of teachers is thinking about the difference between main pay range teachers uh, the requirements of upper pay range the requirements of, of leadership we explore some of that within um, our uh, pay policy and appraisal training workshops we uh, include uh, some guidance around that in our model pay policy and appraisal policy so what does it mean to go through threshold and what are the changing standards of expectation in terms of that process and that progression um, so again additional resources there uh, from what's on screen additional resources that you can make use of to support um, with those uh, elements um, I have haven't got any questions that have come through so um, hopefully that's not an issue with the technology but more because we're providing you with helpful advice and guidance I'm certainly going to work on that basis if there are any issues with technology um, then uh, you folks know where we are you'll have our email addresses and um, do just drop us a, a line um, but to get you away on time with sort of five to, to 
six minutes to spare. Um, and finally, so um, future webinars. Next month, we're looking at HR um, and workforce planning. So um, that's a revisit of a hot topic from last year, helping you to think about um, stepping into the, the brave new um, school year and thinking about HR um, and planning for the year ahead. September, as ever, standard agenda item will be the Teachers Pay Terms and Conditions document for 2018 that will be released over the summer period. So we'll be highlighting the key changes in that document. Um, and actually, if you get yourselves on our website, um, the details there on screen, you'll be able to sign up for uh, future events as far ahead as this time next year, May 2019. Um, we've got a whole host of events already planned in. Um, you can sign up, uh, register um, for each and every webinar or you can register simply for the topic areas that you're interested in. Do get online and do shout about these webinars to colleagues. If you're finding these useful, and we certainly hope you are, um, then please let as many colleagues as possible know. Um, we're happy to talk to the masses and as long as you're finding the material useful. Um, so other events, there's our uh, ongoing training calendar. Check that out online. Um, we'd be uh, happy to, to see you. We'd love to see you, in fact, in person uh, and follow up on these conversations and other uh, hot HR and management topics besides. Um, thank you for joining us today. Hurrah for Webinar Wednesdays um, and early doors, folks, with five minutes to spare. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the afternoon and a great rest of the week. It's goodbye from us. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.